I had the blessing and privilege of being converted when I was 13 and a half years of age. And I was part of a very thriving and enthusiastic youth group in the little chapel where I was uh, saved. In You will be surprised to know it was Birmingham. <laughs> but as a group of young people, we used to go out and about, sometimes in vehicles and sometimes in a coach, and uh, we used to go to conferences and, and Christian events all around the Midlands. And often on the way there or on the way back, we would sing together. And some of you who are my vintage may well know what we used to sing. I better be careful where I look because there are some of you that are not my vintage. But uh, it used to go something like this. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Any of you remember that? Great, yes, there are some of you that do. Well, we used to sing that. Well, you may not want to vouch for all the theology of a little song like that, but I do think it is how Christians should feel. I really do think we should not feel at home in this world anymore. I want to ask you this morning, do you feel at home in this world these days? Why shouldn't we? Well, in the passage of scripture I want to turn your attention to this morning, the Apostle Paul gives us four good reasons why. We Christians really oughtn't to be feeling at home in this world. I want to turn you to Philippians chapter 3 and verses 18 to 21. Philippians 3 and verses 18 to 21. Why shouldn't a Christian feel at home in this world anymore? And the first answer is because of the kind of world we live in. Because of the kind of world that we live in. Look at verses 18 and 19. The apostle says that there are many walk, that means many whose lifestyle, whose general manner of life, that's what he's referring to in this chapter when he's talking about people walking. It's the way they live. He says there are many walk of whom I have told you often and now with weeping they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. We live in a world by and large which is opposed to the cross, the work, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those of you that are Christians and you've attempted to witness, even to your family, friends, work colleagues, you will soon know, won't you, that generally speaking people are opposed to the message of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think when I was growing up as a teenager, as I mentioned earlier, it seemed to me that there was in our society a kind of a sympathy towards the things of God. Even from unbelievers, there was a sort of a, an acceptance to a degree of these things, which seems to me to have gone completely nowadays. And the opposition to the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ is far more vocal and open and, uh, uh, and vitriolic in these days. So it seems to me that the Apostle Paul is starting off here with a general description of the world in its opposition to the kingdom of God. There are many, he says, around us. And he says in this verse, I have told you often, that implies the fact that it's a common thing uh, for the Apostle Paul in his day. I've often had to say this, he says. Many people around there, the whole lifestyle, attitude, the way they live is in opposition to the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says the awful thing about this, verse 19, is these are people whose end is destruction. Their end is destruction. So many people are happily on the broad road that ends in destruction. What a sad thing. How do you know who these people are? Well, as he says in verse 19, one of the things that you notice is their God is their belly. 
and a God is their belly. Sounds a strange phrase. Doesn't necessarily mean that all non-Christians are gluttons. No, it doesn't. What it means is this, really. It means that, that, that these people, their, self, their, their self-satisfaction is their aim in life. To be self-satisfied in who I am and how things are and the way life is to be satisfied and to find my satisfaction in this world. In other words, my God is this world and in this world and the things I can enjoy in this world. So you'll get people, who want, they, they say, what they want to do is, is fulfil their bucket list. So they have a bucket list and their great aim, their ambition is to get through it all before... They are, they're not well enough or they're not compassmentous or before they die. Get through their bucket list. For others, it's about climbing the social ladder or getting on well at work. It's about status and about other people looking up to them. For others, it's about uh, educational achievement. I uh, know somebody who's forever studying and forever getting degrees and such like. That's his great ambition, but it's all focused in this world. There are others who have other ambitions, sportsmen and women and all sorts of things, that they, they need and feel this is the thing I've got to achieve in this life. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. There's nothing wrong with having ambition. There's nothing wrong in going and seeing lovely places. In a sense, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with, with a bucket list in and of itself. I mean, uh, I've always been interested in railways. My dad was a, was a steam engine fitter for 52 years. And in the school holidays, I used to have the joy of going down to the engine sheds and we were up on the big steam engines, taking them down the coal implant, turning them round on the turntable. I loved it. And so when they, when they opened the Channel Tunnel and the, uh, the trains were going through, one of my bucket list ambitions was to go on the Eurostar. And so about four years ago, Margaret and I went to Paris with a couple of friends from church on the Eurostar, and that was great. And then last year, now you'll never invite me again, I know, but I may as well confess my sin. Uh, Last year, was it, um, the uh, ABBA opened up their ABBA Voyage show in London, this this light show. And about a month ago, my, uh, my middle daughter took me to see ABBA. And it was great. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. I really did enjoy it. So that was one of my other little bucket list things. I wanted to go and see Abba. And she took me to see Abba. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't, I don't, I don't want Christians to be miserable people who withdraw from the world. Oh, Abba, that's terrible. Oh, I used to sing to the Beatles. Oh, that's awful. I don't think Christians should be like that. Doesn't the Lord say, I've given you all things... To enjoy, he says, in this world. But the problem is, when all those things are in our lives and we ignore God, and that's the problem, I think, that the Apostle Paul is highlighting here. Here are people, their whole manner, their manner of life is to enjoy the world, get what they can out of the world, but leave God completely out of the picture not have anything to do with him, he has nothing to do with them. That's their view. And their end is destruction. But it leads them into awful things. As he says in verse 19, he says, their glory is their shame. In other words, people who are focused entirely on the world and live for the world, sooner or later, they begin to live and to imbibe shameful things. And even boast of shameful things. Sometimes it's in the way they dress. You see it with celebrities sometimes. Or should I say the way they undress almost. And yet they boast in these things. The, ma- the, matter, the main matter is how you look and how you present yourself. As though these are the most important things in life. And people start to become proud of their sins and encourage others in them. They glory 
is in their shame. It's no wonder the Apostle Paul says in verse 18, I tell you often and I tell you again now, and he says, even with weeping, even with weeping, these people who are enemies of the cross. I was with a Christian friend from America. We were on a mission trip to Glasgow a few years ago. And we were at the, t the head of the main Glasgow shopping street. And it's a big, wide boulevard with shops and, and restaurants and so on all the way down. And a mass of people in front of us. And my friend said to me, look at this, he said, a sea of lostness. A sea of lostness is how he described it. And I think one of the reasons, another reason why the Apostle Paul in verse 18 talks about, I'm telling you this with weeping, is because there's, a, there's, there's certainly a hint here that this includes some professing Christians. There are Christians who profess to believe in God and even profess to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet they are people whose appetites for the things of this world come before their adoration of the Lord. They are, they are people for whom their comforts in this life come before their commitment to the Lord. They are folks whose status in this world matters more to them than sacrificial service for the Lord. These are dear folks who hope for heaven, but in the end are bound for hell. Their end is destruction. And in a sense, they are the worst enemies of the cross of Christ. You get atheistic people. They don't even pretend to believe in God. They have no interest whatsoever in the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll ridicule him, make jokes about him, swear in his name and so on and so forth. It's obvious and plainly obvious. They have no interest in Christianity at all. But often the major enemies of the cross of Christ are people who say they believe and yet, as Paul says here in verse 19, their minds are set on earthly things. So they're saying they're Christians on the one hand, but on the other hand, they are living and their views and their values are all worldly. They are the bigger enemies of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are people who profess to know the Lord and yet look at life with a whole worldly viewpoint. Let me straight what I mean. <clears throat> Some years ago, one of the members of our church got very keen on photography. And I'm talking now about the days when we still used to put a film in the camera. And he discovered, he got himself a single lens reflex, which were quite the things in those days, and used to screw a filter on the front. And he got fascinated by this idea of taking pictures through a filter. And he, he got himself an orange filter. And he went out and he photographed everything with his orange filter on it. So all the whole world looked orange. So consequently, when he took a picture of the sky, it was orangey. And the grass was orangey. And if he took pictures of people, they all looked as if they'd just come back from Spain with sunburn. That's how everybody looked. They were all orange. The whole world was orange. That was the lens through which he was taking his pictures. And it seems to me that there are people, and the vast majority of people perhaps in the Western world, who see the world today through this godless filter. That's how they see everything. They see everything without God, without an interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's their view of the world. It's the opposite to what Paul says to the Corinthians when he says we have the mind of Christ. Christians have the mind of Christ. Now, the mind of Christ is given to us in Scripture. That's his mind on things. There it is, his view of the world and of life, etc., but I think it means more than that. When he says we have the mind of Christ, I also think he means that we've been given by the Holy Spirit the ability to think about life in the way that he thinks about it. To see life and the world from a Christ-like point of view. I think that's included in having the mind of Christ, whereas the worldly person can only see things in the world 
from a worldly point of view. The contrast between the Christian and the non-Christian. The, con- the non-Christian can only see the world in a worldly way. But the Christian can see the world from a heavenly point of view. A Christian is someone who should live in the world with heaven in mind. Is that how you live? Is that describing your life? You see, I think it's so important to take these things seriously because the world needs to see that the gospel changes people's lives. The gospel changes people's views. The gospel changes people's outlook on life. Living and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ transforms life down here. And if people in the world look at us as professing Christians and think that, well, they are not much different to me, if the gospel makes no difference to them, why should it make any difference to me? If it doesn't transform them, it ain't going to transform me. Then why should I bother? I think we need in these days more and more to live Christian lives that are a real contrast to the views and ideas and the way in which the people of the world live. And why then ought we to be like this? And the answer in the second place is in verse 20, because of the home to which we belong. Because of the home to which we belong. Paul actually begins verse 20 with the for. Why should we not be like the world? Well, for or because, he says in verse 20, because our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Heaven, the eternal home of God the Father. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father in heaven. It's the home of the eternal Father God. It's the residence of our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the throne of God and the majesty of heaven. It's the place from which the Holy Spirit comes down. The Holy Spirit has been sent to us from heaven. It's the dwelling place or the the place from which the angels go out and serve and work. The angels and the archangels, the other hosts of heaven. It's the eternal home of all the Christians who have gone before us. We are having a very sad time in the life of our church at Hopeby. We've just lost two of our long-serving members uh, have just died and their funerals are in the same week, in a couple of weeks' time. And um, you might pray for us. Um, Although I'm well and truly retired, of course, the widows of these gentlemen want me to Uh, be involved in the funerals although we've now got a pastor who's a good man very good man but you know they they keep dragging the old boy out to (laughs) do the funerals we have another lady in the church who's been with us a good many many years and it's patently obvious that she's got terminal cancer we've got another good brother who was a deacon and an elder in our church for a good many years and he's terminally ill as well We also have a six-week-old baby in hospital right now with suspected meningitis. And uh, it just seems a a tough time. But I'm I'm saying that, you know, the best is yet to come because the brothers and sisters that are leaving us, they're at home in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, You think of all those people over history who, as the scripture tells us, they they desired a better country that they were looking forward to, a heavenly one. Remember, dear Christian friend, your citizenship is in heaven. This word citizenship is an interesting word. It's only used once in the whole of the New Testament, the word in the original for citizen. And it means to live under a particular government and it means to live in a particular state. Now, now that's very relevant here. Context here really matters because Paul is writing to Philippi, the Christians at Philippi. And Philippi was a Roman colony and an administrative centre for that whole area of the Roman Empire. 
And you could almost say it was the Eastbourne or the Bournemouth of the Roman Empire because it's where all the old dears retired to. It was very often used as a retirement place for veterans of the Roman army. So that was not an unusual thing. And so Philippi was a very Romanesque kind of town, city. But the, the big thing about living in Philippi is that if you were a free citizen, that is if you were not a slave, because it didn't apply to slaves, but if you were a free citizen living in Philippi, you lived as if you were a resident of Rome. You had all the rights and privileges of the citizens of Rome. You were considered to be a Roman citizen whilst living in Philippi. And when Paul says your citizenship is in heaven, that's the background to the use of the word citizenship right there. And so he's using this word, he's saying, you believers, you brothers and sisters, remember your citizenship is in heaven. In other words, yes, you are living on earth, like these people living in Philippi, but what you're doing, you're living on earth with the rights and the privileges to a large extent of those who are already living in heaven. What do we mean by that? Well, you have the presence of the Lord if you're a Christian. I'm with you always. Just as those in heaven are in the presence of the Lord, you have his presence too. He says, I am with you. You are fully forgiven here on earth, just as much as all those who have gone before us are fully forgiven in heaven. They can't be in heaven if they're not fully forgiven. They are all totally justified that are in heaven. And Paul is saying, and so are you while you're living on earth. You're completely and fully justified. There's no condemnation whatsoever to all those who surround the throne in heaven already and there's no condemnation to you who are living on earth. All their guilt has gone and if you're a Christian, all your guilt has gone. You're living on earth with the same sort of privileges and blessings in a way of those who are in heaven. Yes, not in its fullness, not its completeness, but it's there. It's yours because you are citizens of heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven. You're living on earth as if your lives are already wrapped up in heaven. And it's, it's better than the situation in Philippi. Because you see, if you were a slave in Philippi, you couldn't be a citizen of heaven, uh, sorry, of, of Rome. You weren't allowed. But you see, those of us that know the Lord, we were slaves down here. We were slaves to sin. But now, we've been delivered and set free from sin. Free citizens of heaven already, if we know the Lord. Let me put it like this. Every true Christian has what I'm going to call an unrescindable passport to heaven. Nobody can take that passport away from you. Nobody can annul it. The Lord gives it to you. And it's your passport to glory. I think about uh, Alan and, and, and Malk who have recently gone to be with the Lord and, and thinking it, it's rather like arriving at the airport and uh, you've got you've got your passport and you've got every right to go straight through the nothing to declare channel into the presence of the Lord. And that's what they've done. Straight through the nothing to declare channel into the presence of their Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And the reason, because they were all ready citizens of heaven, nobody could keep them out. Nobody could say you can't come in because that's what they already were. Do you have your passport to heaven, folks? Are you assured of that? Has the Lord given you that and assured you of that, that you're on your way to glory? Are you assured that you belong in heaven more than you belong on earth, are you already living and beginning to enjoy the privileges that 
those brothers and sisters are already enjoying so much more fully in glory. But you see, the Apostle Paul encourages us here not to live like the world, but to live as citizens of glory. Because, you see, we're above all things, we are looking forward to the one we're waiting for. We're looking forward to the one we are waiting for. You see that there in verse 20, where our citizenship is in heaven, from which or from where we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting for him to come. He's the one who came from heaven and gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world. He's the one who has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the beloved Son. It's in him we have redemption. Through him we have the forgiveness of sins. The one who is coming and who one day every Christian will say is the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you waiting eagerly for him? Are you really longing and looking forward to seeing him? You see, there's a couple of ways of waiting, isn't there? I guess you've all been in the dentist's waiting room. You have a group of people and they are there and they are waiting to see the dentist. Have you ever noticed how quiet it is in a dentist's waiting room? Very few people say anything. Maybe somebody's flicking through a magazine and you can tell they're not really taking any notice of it. They're just looking at the pictures. Others are sitting there looking at the floor. Somebody's twiddling their thumbs. They're all waiting to see somebody. They're all waiting to see the dentist. And there's a sense in which they're dreading when the, the, the waiting room door opens and their name's called but they are still waiting to see the dentist. You can be waiting like that. Or you can wait in another way. I have a granddaughter who lives in Brisbane, Australia. And now and then she comes over and visits us. And my daughter, her mother, goes to the airport to meet her. And you know what it's like when you're meeting somebody that you haven't seen for a while at the airport, somebody you dearly love. You go into the airport and there on the, on the screens, it, it gives you the arrivals, the arrival screens. And it'll say something like, you know, KLM flight 719, and then it'll say, landed. And you think to yourself, she's here. I haven't seen her yet, but she's on the ground. She's here. And then you go to the barrier, don't you? And you stand there and the, the automatic doors are opening. The people are coming through with their little trolleys and others with great big trolleys with all their luggage on. And you're standing there and you're waiting. And then the doors open and there she is. And what happens? The tears well up, don't they? And your arms go up and the great big smile on your face. You can't wait to hug and kiss. And the tears flow and the joy is expressed. Thinking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, are you more like the dentist's waiting room than you are the airport arrivals hall? That's how we ought, I think, to be eagerly waiting to see the Lord who is coming for us from glory. It's almost that sense, you know, can't wait, I can't wait. I think we need to think more often about our Lord and who he is and what he's done for us, I think we'd be much more eager to see him when he comes. Let's try and encourage one another to look forward more eagerly to the return of the Lord, eagerly waiting. But you know, Paul says here, and you might almost feel this is an anticlimax, but he still says it, he says there's still something else as a reason why we shouldn't be living like the world. And it's because when the Lord comes, his coming will result 
in a remarkable transformation and we'll become the people we are going to be. We should become the people we are going to be. You see it there in verse 21. He will transform our lowly bodies that it might be conformed to his glorious body. There's a remarkable, amazing transformation going to take place when he comes. A miraculous metamorphosis is going to occur for every Christian, for every Christian. It's going to be an absolute radical change from the body that we are currently living in, the body that we are now dying in, that body is going to be changed into an entirely glorious body. When he appears, we will be like him as we see him as he is. Paul calls it a lowly body. The scripture says that our bodies are are fearfully and wonderfully made, and they are the human body. This body in which we live is a remarkable bit of kit. But when you think of it, it's made out of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and about eight other elements. That's what you are. As the scripture says, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. That's what Paul means, I think, when he calls it a lowly body. It's, it's earthly, though amazingly created. But when the Lord transforms that body, it's going to be imperishable. There's a good number of us here today, and we know what it means now to have a perishing body. It's getting weaker, and the, there's not so much hair, and it's not the colour it used to be, and uh, the eyesight's not what it ought to be. You know, as we get older, we don't hear so good, we don't see so good, and so very often we don't smell so good either. But that's life, isn't it? We live in a lowly, perishing body. But then our bodies will be imperishable. Won't be earthbound. They'll be spiritual. They won't be limited. They'll be powerful. Yes, there'll be hands and feet and flesh and bones, just like Jesus had in his resurrection body, as he showed it to his disciples after the resurrection. And that body will be a miraculous body. It'll be able to do amazing things. It's a, it's a body that can fly. It's a body that can breathe in a rarefied atmosphere. How do we know? Because we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Just like he ascended into glory. It'll be a radiant body. Radiate glory. Jesus said of his people, the righteous shall shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. The kingdom of heaven. Shine brilliant. Every Christian's going to be brilliant in heaven. And as he says, Paul says here in verse 21, it's all according to the working by which he's able to subdue all things to himself. You'd say to yourself, oh, I can't believe this. I don't think, surely not. This don't seem right. But the Lord Jesus Christ will put the powers, the dynamic of deity into creating a resurrection glorified body for every single one of his people, including you and me, if we know the Lord as our Lord and Saviour. And in that glorious, glorified body, we will be forever with the Lord. I ask you this question, folks. Who wouldn't want to be like that? Who wouldn't want to be like that? So let's be assured that our end is not destruction. We are not of those whose end is destruction. Let's be sure we're not making a god of our appetites. Let's be sure we're not glorying in those things that we really ought to be ashamed of. Let's live our lives not setting our minds on earthly things, but set our minds on the things of Christ in heaven where he is seated at the right hand of God. Let's set our sights on our heavenly home and be eagerly waiting 
for his return. Let's talk to one another about these things. Let's share them together. Let's talk about the kind of bodies we're going to live in, in glory. Let's talk about the amazing things that we're going to see and do. Just as he is now and be forever with him. So let's make every effort, as Paul says right at the end here, to stand fast, solidly, soundly, in and for the Lord, and live much more eagerly waiting for his return. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together a song from...